Thanks very much, Ruth, and it's a great pleasure to, uh, to speak at this uh, university where uh, so much has happened over the last hundred years, and I'll try and talk about some of those things. Um, I, I was originally a medical doctor, and, and I still edit the Journal of Medical Ethics, um, but I'm now on a philosophy faculty, and I see some, some white coats there in the audience. Um, this won't be one of my most clinical and applied talks, but I'm happy to, to uh, answer questions at the end about other topics. But I will try to, to draw it, its relevance to some of the issues you, you might face every day. But bear with me if it seems a little bit <coughs> philosophical. It's what I've been working on for the last eight years. And in my own area, it has kicked off a field of, of inquiry. So let me start with a quiz. Um, let me ask you, what, what do you think the main cause of climate change is? Humans. Humans. Ah, oh, this is why I shouldn't have come to the school. <laughs> Normally people say carbon emissions. Um, spoiled by, by air <laughs> Alright, what's the cause of terrorism? I'm going to answer it now. Uh, so, so what's the cause of, of terrorism and religious fundamentalism? But uh, as you correctly observe, the real problem is human choice and behaviour. Problems that cause public health and, and in fact one of our large grants uh, is on collective responsibility, collective behaviour and infectious disease and microbial resistance, vaccines and these kind of areas. But even something like the Fukushima nuclear disaster is not only caused by a tsunami, because we know what causes tsunamis. It's the result of the choice to build a nuclear reactor in a certain place with a certain level of protection. So for the first time in human history, our fate is largely going to be in our hands this century. So this century is quite different to other centuries. Um, what happens to human beings, how well their lives go, what diseases they suffer from, will largely be determined by the choices that they make. Um, and the world today is vastly different to how it has been through virtually all of human history. Richard Pother estimates that there's enough plutonium uh, floating around former, uh, the former Soviet Union to, to fuel 20,000 uh, atomic bombs. More dangerous still, as a result of our escalatingly powerful technology, are biological weapons. Um, the mouse on the left is infected with mousepox. In the early 2000s, scientists in Canberra were modifying the interleukin gene in, in an attempt to create a vaccine that controlled the mouse plague that was affecting Australia by rendering mice infertile. But instead of producing infertility, they produced a super lethal strain uh, of mousepox. Now, mousepox is very similar to smallpox, one of the greatest infectious killers of human beings through human history. Um, the same kind of change could be done genetically to, to human smallpox, making it not 30% lethal, but 100% lethal. Um, and indeed, you can construct viruses fairly easily with relatively low tech, widely accessible materials. On the right is polio virus, which has been artificially constructed. Smallpox is larger, and to my knowledge, <coughs> hasn't so far been uh, constructed de novo, but it's only a matter of time and synthesizing ability before you'll be able to make smallpox, even super lethal smallpox, at a relatively small scale facility that could kill not just hundreds of people, but millions or even billions of people. So this era of massive technological advance and progress is also associated with a downside, an ever-increasing risk of not just mishap, but potentially existential uh, threats, what we call in the book that I began with uh, on the urgent need for moral has we call ultimate harm. So one problem of this century is we've got much greater power than we've ever had. And that power is distributed not just in the hands of a small number of people in, in Russia and the United States, but increasingly in the hands of hundreds of thousands of people. So, in my view, everyone has their own favourite list of threats, but biological weapons are one of the greatest threats to humanity in this century. 
Um, the second problem is that we evolved um, on the African savannah. And essentially our biology and psychology is the same as our hunter-gatherer ancestors who evolved uh, over the last few thousand years. We, weren't, we didn't evolve to be saints, we didn't evolve to make good choices. We evolved as the blind products of human evolution. But of course, today, we don't live in the African savannah with primitive tools. We live in a globalised world um, where one event in one part of the world can have massive effects on others and over subsequent generations. So many of the problems that we face in a global world, such as the failure to aid, are explicable in terms of our moral psychology, the sorts of animals that we are and the sorts of inherent moralities that which I'll come and discuss. So only about six or seven countries have now reached the very modest target of donating 0.7% of their GDP to foreign aid. And you see the current American uh, primary races, the, the role of human nature in, uh, and its primitive tribal nature. The two biggest economies, the US and at that time Japan, donated the least to foreign aid. And inequality is not reducing, it's increasing. These are the three big richest men. Um, the wealthiest fifth of the world's population stands for 86% of its GDP, the poorest fifth for only 1%. <coughs> and inequality has been increasing relentlessly. And so about 100 years ago, the difference between the richest country and the poorest country in terms of the capita income was three to one. And it's now greater than 100 to one. And many of the problems such as climate change, uh, environmental problems, are not caused by single individuals, they're caused by millions of people who are anonymous to each other with little reason to trust each other, the so-called tragedy of the commons. Now historically, humans manage resources and competition for resources on a small scale where they are able to absor observe other farmers or other people using that limited community resource and punish free riders and there was a stake in the future and you could observe your effect. That isn't the case with global collective commons problems such as antibiotic resistance, depletion of resources, CO2 emissions, and many of the global problems that we create today. Um, so we're not psychologically set up either to protect ourselves from massive point incident harms such as the deployment of biological weapons, or to deal with global collective action problems such as the alleviation of polio or climate change. So while Stephen Pinker is right that violence is at an all-time low, risk continues to increase exponentially as the power of technology increases. And this kind of scenario has been uh, <coughs> in, in Hollywood through the, through the 12 months. Okay, so as I said, we, we began as animals. So the last eight years or so, we've got a small group doing some scientific research, neuroscience, neuroimaging, as well as cognitive science research into human moral choices. And this is just a tiny drop in the, the very small pool of research into moral psychology and moral neuroscience. Um, now, our moral dispositions, morality evolved, essentially, ordinary morality. Um, tick for tack. When somebody provides you with help or a benefit, you respond with gratitude. If somebody exploits you or harms you, you respond with anger. Uh, you apologise when some, you step on somebody's toe. Ordinary moral reactions and responses and behaviour are evolved to enable cooperation with small groups and to protect members of that group from harm uh, and to protect that group from other humans competing for resources. It evolved to facilitate small group cooperation. So our moral dispositions are limited. That's a part of our nature. We're biased towards the near future, we're biased towards small numbers, we care about our family and friends, we're able to cooperate but usually in, in uh, small groups and there's a tendency to free ride and there's an inherent distrust of strangers and xenophobia. <coughs> so racism is everywhere. Everyone is to some degree racist. We're programmed to pick out our group members as potential threats. Uh, and that uh, is something that exists at an unconscious level. 
can be overcome, um, but it's by certainly by, by certainly not not the exception to the rule. Rather, it is the rule. And what you see today, and in many parts of the world, as uh, as as pressures are placed on a system, these basic tendencies, as you saw in the former Yugoslavia after the fall of communism, erupt into to xenophobia and outright violence. We're especially partial to our family and friends, and we're disposed to create groups of uh, insiders and outsiders, because even when material resources are plentiful, status and, uh, and other uh, luxury goods are always a limited resource. So morality evolved to stop us killing each other in these small groups. It was important to, um, to not do things that harmed other people, but because we couldn't benefit others in, in great ways, there was no obligation to aid or no right to aid. And we believe that we're primarily responsible for what we do and not for what we allow to happen. So in medicine, this is manifested in the belief that many physicians have that there's a difference between acting and omitting, between <coughs> on the one hand killing and on the other hand allowing to die. And within allowing to die, there's a distinction between withdrawing life prolonging medical treatment and withholding life prolonging medical treatment, even when those actions or omissions have the same perceivable and avoidable consequences. So this act-omission distinction is built in to the institutions, the laws, the norms, and indeed the international behaviour um, that we engage in. It's very difficult to empathise as a human being with more than one other individual. The more people you see suffering, the less you tend to help. Um, so these factors, the act of mission doctrine, limited altruism, and the sheer numbers of people involved in modern dilemmas present obstacles to human moral decision making. So, I'm never surprised when these Paris agreements or Kyoto agreements and so on fail to secure binding agreements because we're just not the sorts of beings that are going to engage in those sorts of agreements. Um, so, uh, there are a number of other reasons why climate change and modern problems are particularly difficult um, to solve, but I think I've presented the picture clearly enough. Human animal has a set of moral dispositions, a set of moral behaviours. It has great capacities, but it also has significant limitations. So within healthcare, this, the, the idea of this um, identification of psychological biases and heuristics within public health has driven this whole field of nudge, of structuring human choice to take advantage of the inherent biases and heuristics to encourage more healthy behaviour. So, here you know this much better than I do, but placing healthier options within the uh, more immediate visual field, having an opt-out system for organ donation, structuring choice so that the default is the more uh, healthy option. This is a simple application of knowledge around human psychological limitation to engineer, in this case, public health. What I want to look at now is whether we could not only use these psychological structuring of choices to encourage more moral behaviour, such as encouraging people to donate their organs, which if, in passing I think is the most minimal moral duty. Sometimes people ask me, you know, how can we ever agree on, on moral enhancement or moral improvement if we can't agree on what ethics is? Well, I'll tell you one thing that is, is, is a basic ethical principle, no matter what final morality you settle on, and that's a duty of easy rescue. When the cost to you is very small and the benefit to somebody else is very large, morally you ought to do that thing. And what's the easiest rescue you can do? You can donate your organs when you're dead because you have no longer any use for them. And you can save seven or eight. So this is the basic test of, of people's uh, moral maturity, whether they're prepared to, to donate organs. Um, so that duty of easy rescue is what is one goal. Could we actually change people's biology as well as changing their psychology or the psychological framing of their decisions to encourage or even generate more moral behaviour? Well, we've done quite striking things with non-human animals. <coughs> 300 different breeds of dogs that you're all familiar with vary enormously. Some are smart, some are stupid, some are vicious, some are placid, some are hard-working, some are lazy. 
<laughs> That's all genetic. It's the result of a very long genetic experiment called selective breeding from a small group of canids and wolves. What, we, what has taken us around 10,000 years to do with dogs can be done in a single generation through genetic engineering. On the left is a fluorescent rabbit called Alba, created by French scientists for the artist Eduardo Katz. Glows in the dark because it has a gene from a jellyfish inserted into its genome at the embryonic stage, germline genetic engineering. Fluorescent monkeys have been created as well. On the right is a human embryo that's fluorescing. Um, the embryo was destroyed, um, but this was done by inserting a gene from a jellyfish into a human embryo. So in principle, you can create a fluorescent human being today. That's not, obviously not a moral improvement or improvement of public health, but what it shows in principle is the ability to change human nature is profound. I'm not going to talk about CRISPR and, and uh, Cas9 and the possibility of gene editing. Ruth and I have been involved in a group looking at the regulation of gene editing, but this could profoundly change uh, disposition to disease, but also <coughs> any human characteristic. Uh, how significant is the potential to change the nature uh, of the human animal? Well, let's look to the mouse. Uh, on the back is a normal mouse running at 20 metres per minute. On the front is a genetically engineered pet CK mouse. Uh, they're hungry, they're looking for food, they'll continue to run until they're exhausted. The normal mouse can covers 200 metres. The genetically engineered Super mouse runs six kilometers. In orders of magnitude, greater ability to metabolize sugar. It needs to eat twice as much, needs twice as many calories. Um, and this was done to investigate uh, muscular dystrophies. Um, and it's a simple change in the sugar cycle of the mouse. Now, why are there no super mice in the wild? There are two reasons. One is the mutation occurred, but it was too expensive. Um, so it died out because you had to fuel the metabolism that was much higher. Or it just didn't occur. But today we can create super mice. And the same sugar cycle potentially could be altered for human beings. Now we haven't seen genetic engineering of human beings, but we have seen some of the effects of human performance enhancement. You're all familiar with that great devil, Lance Armstrong. Uh, in fact, doping is very common. This is the famous Seoul Olympics, where six out of eight runners were subsequently shown to be doping. Uh, here is the list of people who are run under 9.8 seconds. Eight of them have been implicated, or nine of them have been implicated in doping, only one has the same fault. Um, one third of the medals in the London Olympics, when re analysed by in independent uh, experts, Michael Ashton and his colleagues, were thought to have suspicious blood findings. So doping shows how effective human physical enhancement can be, and that also how common it is. Could we do the same thing around moral capacities? Well, it's a basic, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this fact um, more than I am. It's a basic fact, first of all, that humans <coughs> evolved uh, to survive long enough to reproduce and pass on, to the, on their genes to the next generation. And humans vary. Every human characteristic varies. So this is the normal distribution curve for hematocrit. Now, why is doping so uh, difficult to detect? And the reason is because when you move from here to here, you're moving within the normal range. So you don't know whether the person started here or started here. Um, is it unsafe? No, it's not unsafe, because this is the normal human range. So why, be, why did Lance Armstrong never definitively fail a test? Even though each few years we were told that there was a new test for repo, there was a new test for, for blood doping and so on, it's because he was just moving within this range. Why, 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 do, why do all of the athletes within uh, the Olympics not get caught? It's because they're taking testosterone within this range. Of course, if they took it out here, it'd be pretty obvious. And of course, that would be unsafe. But the point here is that nobody is equal. And, these, and as athletics shows, these, difference, these differences <coughs> make a difference to winning and losing. But when it comes
comes to the moral stakes, these differences could make a difference to the fate of the planet, or indeed um, the fate of a whole country. You know, if you're looking at the bottom 1% of people, 1% of the world are psychopaths, 70 million psychopaths in the world, it only takes one of them to decide to create uh, a biological weapon of smallpox. And it's, it's a disaster. So shifting this curve, moving within this curve, can have massive behavioural effects. And the US military, way ahead of everyone else on this, and they've known for a long time that people are not equal. And those natural inequalities have significant effects for things that matter. And this is the IQ curve. And from the Second World War, they were not taking people in who were normal, that were in the bottom 15%. And now, they take people who are, uh, in, they will take people only with an IQ over, I think, 93. Every year, the um, US Department of Education conducts essentially an IQ test and puts people into five categories, the National Adult Literacy Survey. The US Department of Education has said that the people in the bottom two categories, which constitute nearly 50% of the population lack the abilities to enjoy and satisfy the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. So it's only with an IQ less than 70 that you're judged to have a disorder, a disease, an intellectual disability. Okay. What, where does that figure come from? It's two standard deviations below the mean, 2% of the population. What's important about it? Nothing. You, you could have defined intellectual disability as one standard deviation below the mean. In fact, Many people say this, this IQ between 70 and 85, low normal, is highly disadvantageous in a complex society like today. So normal has no intrinsic moral significance. The question is always, what's our goal? In this case, the military's goal, getting a functioning soldier capable of obeying orders. In this case, it might be getting a job of your choice or uh, being healthy. Where you lie on these different curves will affect your chances of achieving that, and we can change that today. Um, you can change this through education, and potentially you'll be able to change it through medicines that are developed initially to treat people at this level, at this end, but that will enhance people at this level, or enhance people at this level. So ethics is about how you want to use that power. And I'm going to talk briefly towards the end about how we want to make ethical decisions. Now sometimes people say, oh, this is all very interesting, you know, yes, it applies to dopamine sport, but moral decision making, that's something that is, you know, to do with our reason and, uh, and not to do with these basic biological factors. How can biology affect our moral decision making? Well, again, you're living in a fantasy land around the nature of the human animal. <laughs> you don't believe that we're highly determined in our choices. This is my favourite example from Israel, an ecologically valid example. So these Israeli uh, researchers studied the willingness to offer <coughs> parole to prisoners who were coming up uh, for, for assessment of their crimes. And they found that the time of day which the case came for the judge was correlated with whether parole was going to be offered. So if the case came soon after a meal, they were much more likely to be offered parole. This is highly statistically significant. If it came to all where the judge was angry and hungry, much less likely to be offered uh, parole. And the standard change after the range of after the Now, whether you get parole should not be determined by whether the judge is hungry or not. Now, you, you can't decide which of these decisions is the right ethical decision by looking at a curve. You need some ethical standards. Maybe these ones were too lax, maybe these were too severe. But what this does show is there's an arbitrariness from physiological factors that affect moral decisions that shouldn't be affected. It may not be related to glucose, it may be related to something else. But what it shows is that our biology affects how we make choices. A male trained his morning testosterone predicts his day's profitability. Um, testosterone seems to increase not aggressive tendencies, but one's concern for independent for social status. And this can lead to admirable effects in certain circumstances. Um, it can also increase fair bargaining when people are unaware that they receive testosterone. So I'm not suggesting here that testosterone or reducing testosterone is some kind of moral improvement. What I want to show is that things that go on in our bodies affect
affect morally relevant outcomes. The field of enhancement is, uh, is old and well known to you. The world's second largest export is of an enhancer, caffeine. There are many substances which enhance cognitive performance to some degree. Uh, since the 1960s, we've known uh, Walter Michel conducted his famous impulse control experiments on four-year-old children. That ability to control impulse, self-control, ability to delay gratification is a fundamental quality that affects how people's lives go. When Walter Michel followed his four-year-old children ten years later, those who had were able to withstand the temptation of a marshmallow in order to receive two later on had more friends, more motivation to succeed, better academic performance. And this quality is more highly correlated with university entrance than their IQ was. Um, now today we have drugs which improve impulse control. Ritalin is one of them. So Ritalin is both a cognitive enhancer, it also reduces impulsive aggression. And I'll come back to this later in the discussion of criminal behaviour. It's also, if you like, a crude or rough form of moral enhancer enabling more effective social functioning. Modafinil is another new class of drug that's been on their analysis shown to have uh, beneficial cognitive effects. Now these sorts of effects in terms of cognition can have profound increase based on removal from lead from petrol and paint. Um, it's estimated that a three-point IQ increase, a population level IQ increase, would reduce poverty by 25% and jobs by 25%, welfare assistance by 80%. So if Donald Trump wants a way of reducing these outcomes, probably one of the most cost-effective things you could do is work out how to increase people's IQ by three points. Because of the significant cost of the tail, um, it would add, a hundred, well, these are all figures, one and a half percent to GDP. The information revolution, the internet, computing, these are just external cognitive enhancements. If you do this internally, you'll have the same kind of massive benefits. In fact, again, the military is investing a lot in this. They've said if all 4.2 billion people of working age had even a very modest increase in IQ, it would have the same economic effects as the introduction of the internet. So small effects can have profound social impacts. And these impacts will also flow on to health. People who have a high IQ, less likely to be murdered, more likely to be healthier, uh, more likely to uh, engage in public health strategies, uh, less, less likely to be <coughs> accidents. Another range of substances that have effects on moral behaviour are those that regulate the serotonin network, so it's so-called the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, these reduce criticism of others, result in fairer distribution of resources, reduce rejection of unfair offers, increase diversion, harming others. These aren't straightforwardly moral benefits, but they are moral effects. So many people on psychiatric medications are behaving different, moral, differently morally as a result of the drugs. They're not just feeling happier, they're actually making different moral choices. Oxytocin, another well study neuro hormone released by uh, breastfeeding, sexual intercourse and touching, but also by the oral contraceptive pill and glucocorticoids, it makes people more tribal. It makes them care and trust more people within their in-group. Less likely to trust and cooperate with our group members, um, but benefits the in-group. In Oxford, one of our students, Sylvia Turbeck, uh, studied the effect of the beta blocker of Pranol on, in, on that implicit racial bias I described at the beginning. And it reduces implicit racial bias. Probably by an effect in the amygdala, um, but whatever its effect, it actually alters um, racial bias in the implicit association test. There are also non-invasive methods of affecting moral behaviour such as transcranial, magnetic or electrical stimulation. In one study, um, transcranial, electrical and magnetic stimulation to the right temporoparietal junction altered people's uh, willingness to blame others for attempts to harm that were unsuccessful. So they were less likely to blame people successful harms. <laughs> Our, one of the most highly programmed behaviours is the cycle associated with love and reproduction. Three phases in all mammals, it lasts, attracts and attaches.
attachment, different uh, neuro, neurochemical underpinnings. Most study is the attachment phase, and oxytocin is now administered in trials to enhance couple counselling as a way of increasing attachment to dysfunctional couples. So we could potentially use this kind of knowledge in embryo selection or directly to genetically change human beings or to develop drugs such as oxytocin or serotonin, Ritalin, uh, and I'll discuss other potential agents. Or we could more fundamentally genetically change the gene editing human beings as we have in non-human animals. The effects have been striking there, and in principle there's no reason that not only could cystic fibrosis be cured by genetic engineering, but so could be dispositions that increase the probability of psychopathy or callous emotional personality. Such studies have already begun on human embryonic, by uh, human embryo cell lines. So just to finish, what might be some candidates, this sounds to you extremely speculative. Now how could we actually improve people's moral behaviour through medicine? There are two things that are being done at the moment. The, the treatment of impulsive aggression with, uh, with uh, Ritalin and the reduction of sex drive in sex offenders um, through the use of antidepressant agents. Both of these are examples of crude attempts at moral and now, I'm not suggesting that this is the best way of dealing with the problems of, of aggression or, or pedophilia. What we argued in our book, Unfit for the Future, is not that we ought to pursue now a program of using our knowledge of biomedicine to improve moral behaviour, but we ought to study it. There are four ways to bring about any value outcome. You can change the natural environment, you can change the social environment through laws, punishments, institutions, political reform, you can change the psychological environment, structure and choice using knowledge of heuristics and biases, and you can change biology. Now which of those you employ depends on what the research shows in a particular case, around the cost-benefit analysis of it compared to the other alternatives. What we argued is that we need to invest in this research because so critical is the situation that we face in terms of the threats that we have that we need to understand the role of our biology and how it might be modified. So to take one case example, <clears throat> I mentioned before in the case of children really are reducing um, impulsive aggression. In one Swedish study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012, giving violent offenders who had attention deficit disorder Ritalin reduced violent re-offense in men by 32% and women by 41%. That's a massive reduction. That's a big, that's big. And, and that's, that's a good figure. But what does that mean? It means somebody else isn't being harmed unjustly. Um, so this, I'll deal with the question, should all criminals be, with attention deficit disorder place on Ritalin? They should certainly be offered it in my view, um, but should it be mandatory? Chemical castration, another example. I mentioned that this was added that nine states allow castration of sex offenders in the US. Um, Texas even allows surgical castration. Um, now, in some cases, it is mandated. In some cases, it's voluntary. There's different laws in the different states. But this is a, a very crude form of modifying socially relevant behaviour through the use of medicine to prevent crime. This will only get more common as our understanding of the brain and our ability to affect what happens there increases. There will be the call to use these sorts of interventions for social as well as personal benefits. Okay, how do we make choices around this? Ethics is about reasons. It's not about reading off a recipe. It's not about looking to the Ten Commandments to tell you what you're going to do. It's about weighing reasons. It's like physics. Reasons are like vectors. They have a direction and they have a strength. And to work out what you have most reason to do, involves laying out all the vectors, their direction and strength, and summing the vectors. Now, you do this every day. You're moral animals, or you make normative decisions. When you want to buy a car, you weigh different considerations. You weigh the status might point to a certain sort of vehicle. Cost to another. Safety to another. <coughs> so, how do we make moral decisions about using, say, Ritalin in children, or Ritalin violent adult criminals, or the use of uh, antilibidinal agents in criminals. Well, here are some vectors. 
here are some reasons to help you make a decision. Probably, and in fact, I owe a great debt to, to Ruth's husband, Tom Beecher. Right, if you want to read one thing, and many people stop at this point, um, read his book, The Four Principles of Biomedical Ethics. And he articulates essentially four reasons. And every time I go through a problem, these four things you have to consider. There are other things I think you need to consider as well, and I'll talk about some of them. But, but one of those four principles are respect for autonomy, beneficence, that is, improving people's well-being, non-maleficence, not harming them, and justice. So it's a quite a simple thing to employ. And, and Tom says that every ethical code gives some consideration to these four basic principles. And I think he's right, having done this now for 25 years. Um, it's quite useful. But probably the most important, and what you're all about, is not just health, it's well-being. So what is well-being? Well, according to one school, it's happiness. So many psychologists measure through what's called a hedometer, how happy people are, how they're feeling, or desire satisfaction, how satisfied are you with your lives. Um, I think there are also objective goods, things that are good for us, whether or not we want them, in virtue of our nature as animals. And here's a list, that people have different items on their list. But notice that if you think that only happiness and desire satisfaction are, are the things that make what goes, what, what determines how well your life is going, many of the insults, such as paraplegia or injuries, turn out not to have such a great impact on well-being. For a period of time, people's happiness or sense of satisfaction decreases, but they often adapt. <coughs> Humans adapt to loss. They adapt to their circumstances their happiness tends to return to the hedonic set point. Uh, and likewise, they tend to be satisfied, not by events, but by other factors. So for that reason, I think that in many of these cases, we need to include objective elements to assessing the problem. Okay, the second um, main reason is one to do with, as Tom says, autonomy or freedom. We want to make our own choices. So we want not just to have a good life, we want that life to be the life of our choosing. And weighing these two factors is often most of what practical ethics is about. How much choice do you give people and how much do you benefit them? So in terms of the moral enhancement debate, many people have been concerned that changing our biology will undermine our freedom. It will make choices for us, as my colleague and generally supporter of enhancement, John Harris, has written critically about moral enhancement. He said that it would make freedom to do immoral things impossible, rather than simply making them wrong and giving us a legal or moral prudential reason. And what he has in mind are the psychosurgery experiments of the 1960s, lobotomy uh, and amygdalotomy and other highly invasive brain procedures. Indeed, aversion therapy was used for much of the 20th century to treat morally deviant behaviours such as homosexuality and was even considered for use in the penal system. It was the subject of Anthony Burgess's book, A Clockwork Orange, which Stanley Kubrick made uh, infamous through a film. The most highly paid moral philosopher in the world, I think, at Harvard, Michael Sandel, has even criticised this prospect of using the knowledge from medicine and the biosciences to influence moral behaviour as causing unimaginable damage to everything we understand about human moral character. Well, <clears throat> it may. Of course, the amygdalotomies and aversion therapies of the 60s and 70s probably did do that. But is it necessarily so? Imagine that you have a judge in a racist <coughs> area with a racist upbringing who decides to take the crown off to reduce implicit racial bias. Does this destroy everything imaginable around human life? Again, what this view fails to take into account is that there is natural inequality that has morally significant outcomes and there's normal human variation. Another way in which um, interventions can be taken in a way that preserves freedom is by choosing them in a so-called pre-commitment contract. Here's another uh, profound point about how to live your life ethically and prudentially, and that is cleaning your teeth twice a day. Set rules and externalise your person and set um, enforcement procedures that will enable your rules to govern your behaviour. That's the basic challenge of the human condition. It's
they were printed in contracts. Famous example of Ulysses and the Sirens. Ulysses wanted to hear the song of the Sirens. But anyone who heard this song, so beautiful was it, that they were drawn to the island and killed on the rocks. So he asked his men to tie him to the mast and plug their ears with beeswax. And uh, so heard the song of the Sirens uh, and lived to tell the tale. This is a story about the standard human condition, temptation. Uh, now, if a paedophile or a violent criminal chooses to take a substance as a way of regulating their behaviour in a way that they think desirable, this is just a standard expression of human freedom in the light of human moral limitation. So, if the choice is voluntary to take something that you see achieves your goal, it's no threat to freedom. In fact, it's a way to gain freedom in a world where we're constrained by the nature of our choices and by our biology. What would constrain our freedom is something which I, for those of you who are finished this, bear with me a moment, um, I call the God Machine. Imagine that you could precisely control people's thoughts and desires and you implanted a chip that whenever the intention to kill an innocent person Appeared, the chip changed that single intention. Now, this is an extreme version of various forms of neuro intervention. This would reduce people's freedom, especially if they didn't choose to be connected to such a machine. But again, it's important to weigh the vectors. We aren't free in an unrestricted way. We're not free to kill people. We're not free when we're incarcerated. Freedom is only one value. And it may be worth giving up certain values for certain benefits. So I mentioned the example of whether Ritalin should be compulsory for um, violent offenders. If it were made compulsory, this wouldn't be something that protected their freedom. But it might be something that was good for them in terms of promoting their well-being and good for society. Okay, I'm going to finish. I'm not going to go through uh, theories of justice. Um, but always, when you're considering the deployment of new interventions, it's important to ask whether they're being distributed justly. Um, sometimes people are sceptical about making value judgments. If we didn't make value judgments, we wouldn't be able to order a society. And one of the tests of value judgments is to ask, what would you want to preserve or protect such that a loss would be seen advantageous. So, you know, if this is IQ or impulse control or, um, or longevity or health, if something happened that was going to reduce it and you thought that was a bad thing, so you took an intervention that preserved it, that would tend to tell you that this parameter was valuable. The challenge then is to ask, well, if you start at the lower end of that parameter and can do something to raise it up to that level, why not do that if that's a valuable value worth preserving. So if you're prepared to preserve, why aren't you prepared to enhance that characteristic? So everyone was in favour of removing lead from water because it was reducing IQ. But then if I said to you we can put something in the water that will increase people's IQ by 50%, no, that's enhancing. Um, that kind of bias uh, retards progress. <coughs> I'll finish with one last common mistake. Oh, another area where bioenhancement is a possibility is the identification of the monoamine oxidase um, low activity variant. One third of you will have a low activity variant of the gene for monoamine oxidase A. And when you're, when you're brought up in a normal environment, it has no disadvantageous consequences. If, however, you're abused or maltreated or neglected as a child, the association of this common allele highly correlated with criminal behaviour. It was first identified by Hans Brunner, who identified a nonsense mutation where there was zero activity of the gene, which in this family followed an excellent pattern of inheritance. But you could do today genetic profile and screening of embryos from Mayo Low. This would be something that, that's possible today. Okay, I want to finish with this, um, this point. Very often in, in um, bioethics we hear that you should respect people's uh, dignity. And the, the most famous exponent of this ethic of respect and human dignity is Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. And he said, act in such a way that you treat humanity whether 
in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means, but always a means. Never use people as a means. So the objection here is when you decide to um, treat uh, a criminal without their consent, you're using them as a means. When you decide to select uh, an embryo with, a, with, a, with the genes associated with the probability of a higher intelligence, you're using that child as a means to an end. When you decide to clone, you're using the child as a means. When you use mitochondrial transfer, you're treating the child as a means. That's the objection. So many of the uses of advances in biomedicine are objected to because people claim they violate this Kantian principle, the um, principle of humanity. Well, what is it to use somebody as a means? It's to use them as a slave. That's the paradigm of using somebody as a means. But when you create a savior sibling, that is, a child who is not going to otherwise exist as a source of unreliable cord blood to treat a lethal disease in the original child. Are you using that child purely as a means? No, you're not treating them like a slave, provided that you bring them up as an ordinary child. Likewise, with selection of genes for intelligence, provided the child is brought up normally, allowed to participate in sports or music or whatever they choose, you're not treating the child as purely as a means. So this objection only applies to very specific uses uh, of, and in fact practices, that have nothing to do with the, um, with the use of, of the technology for, for beneficial ends that treat that individual with respect. The last point I'll make is a simple one. And then I'll finish, so I see I've run out of time. The concept of coercion is often used in medicine. So, in terms of uh, the use of uh, treatment of, of, of paedophiles or violent criminals, or in terms of <coughs> donation of organs for, for, or payment for organs and so on. Coercion is a technical concept. It means reducing freedom. It means reducing somebody's options to get them to do something that you want. If the person has the status quo available, they're not coerced. So if I offer you a million dollars for your kidney, I'm not coercing you because you have the option of keeping your kidney. If I said your kidney or your life, that would be coercion. So this term is widely misapplied. So none of, whenever you, you make the option of the status quo available, you're never coercing somebody. You might be exploiting them which is taking advantage of some background injustice to get them to, to choose what you want. But it's, not, but it's not coercion. So I think in many of these cases we can make ethical decisions. But it requires us weighing the various reasons that are available. I mentioned the strength of the vectors. You can never tell how strong a reason is without considering its context. So I'll finish with this point. Sometimes people say to me, ethics is relative. It's relative to what our culture thinks or group thinks. If you think that, there is no ethics, because the Nazis were ethical according to their code. What they mean is not that ethics is relative to people's cultural desires. What they mean is it's relative to context. So if you're a rich country uh, and can afford high levels of health care, you may not incentivise contraception, termination of pregnancy, um, to prevent some such as Zika. If you've got enough resources to, to, to care for, for the... If you have an epidemic in a poor country, you may decide to restrict freedom more because the context is different. So it's essential always to evaluate the context. I can't tell you whether the use of biomedicine for moral purposes is going to be ethical or not in advance of considering a specific technology in a specific context. But what I do know is that our choices are fundamentally important, and we ought to use the fruits of our science, not just our psychology, but our biological sciences, to improve our achievement of the goals that we see as important. Thank you.
lot from your talk is that if we can identify individuals who have a vastly disproportionate command of power and resources and who are demonstrating sociopathic tendencies, they should really be the first in line for the moral enhancement. Like I can name eight individuals right now whose behavior might irreversibly set back the cause of um, <laughs> the global climate disruption this year. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, one of the things I think we're told each of is we need a we need a common secular morality, a set of moral standards for education. Okay, and, and also for evaluating our leaders and also selecting our leaders. So in, in the US, you know, what, what's your sort of moral test? It's whether you claim to belong to a Christian church. That's essentially a test, that's your the kind of moral barrier you have to cross. Um, I understand it. Were a committed atheist, you would have no chance of being president. Uh, maybe that's incorrect. But I mean, it's crazy to sort of evaluate. And people are very reluctant to evaluate other people's uh, moral worth. And I think that's a mistake. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we, already with, with the sort of threat of biological weapons, I understand there are processes of, of security clearance for, for certain access to certain sorts of research and certain sorts of agents. So we're going to have to make these choices and we should aim. We should aim for morally better people <laughs> and morally better people as leaders. And so there's a huge discussion there to be had about what that is. But it's unavoidable. We want our children to be moral. So we educate them and punish them to be moral citizens. So we've got an implicit set of standards. I think we ought to discuss what they are and, and what sorts of children we should be bringing up. So it's not a question that's specific to biology, it's a question that we face as communities. And capitalism isn't going to solve that, and economics isn't going to solve that, and the market's not going to solve it, because those are very effective engines of creativity and productivity. But they don't aim at, like evolution at any particular moral outcome. Um, and unfortunately, we, we do need it. And also in health, you need, you, need, you need to make the choices yourself. Uh, you know, a lot of this will depend on the choices that you decide to make for yourself. So what you see in moral morality is also appears in prudence, which is relevant to health. So I was struck by something in the talk where it seemed like the category of um, what counted as enhancements was sort of sliding back and forth between two different things. Um, one more case is where it seems like um, preventing outcomes that it seems like there's really um, not much to be said for these outcomes. It's uncontroversial among people with a variety of moral commitments that these are bad outcomes, bad states, or that these people end up in. So your examples of pedophilia, perhaps psychopathy, seem that way. Then you talked about some other cases like uh, people blaming unsuccessful farmers or being partial. And it seems to me there's a very big difference between. Uh, cases of um, quote-unquote moral enhancement that are of the first kind, and cases that are of the second kind, where it actually, um, as it were, whether or not we count uh, somebody's response uh, changing as an enhancement is going to depend very much on our underlying commitment. Whereas in the first set of cases, there's not going to be anyone sort of, regardless of the differences in their underlying commitments, uh, who's going to endorse it being good for somebody to be, again, attracted to very young children or uh, to be, say, a psychopath. I actually think psychopathy might be more complicated than this even, but maybe there are going to be some uncontroversial. Uh, you're, you're exactly right. I completely agree with you. So what we try to do is, is do a proof of principle, starting with low-hanging fruit. You know, ultimate harm, global collective action problems, poverty, climate change. Um, now, what sort of final, precise morality ought we to aim for? Well, we don't have any agreement on that. I completely agree. So, what, but we didn't stop the whole project uh, before we reach that point, which is an ethical, which is basically a philosophical and ethical project. What we can do is agree on some things that ought to be morally relevant outcomes. So I mentioned another one, duty of easy rescue. So we're doing experiments at the moment on the psychological and uh, neurobiological underpinnings of costly helping. That is, why do some people choose to make a small sacrifice for a large benefit for others, and why do some people not? 
know, what are the factors that affect that sort of behaviour? So that's a candidate, I think, again, for low-hanging fruit, that it's not just... Um, we would all benefit if, if we all engaged in easy rescues. Because that we strikes me as just drastically different than pedophilia. So just, it, it seems to be very interesting that you put these two together as low-hanging fruit. Yeah, well, look, you know, there's, a, there's sure a debate to be had about what the low-hanging fruit is there. Okay. Um, we, fair enough. You might say, well, it's too controversial, that easy rescue stuff. No, we don't want to be getting into that. We just want to stop, you know, violence against innocent people. That's the sole goal. Well, okay, that's the, the first goal. Let's let's study that. The, the main point is that that outcome is not only determined by individual <coughs> social and legal institutions. It's going to be influenced by natural human variation and factors that are capable of biological modification. And I'm interested in the question of whether you should do that for some outcome. We agree. What what outcome we choose? That's the whole moral project. I mean, people have been debating this for 2,000 years, and there are Kantians and Aristotelians and utilitarians and you know, Christians, and people have lots of different moral views. Um, so we, we don't want to be enhancing everyone to, to, to conform to sort of morality X without being pretty sure that's the one. But we can make small steps, and I think there are some low hanging fruit. But people even resist death. Um, and, and that, I think, and that, are there any good objections to that? And the, the important thing is, you know, this is not going to solve the world's problems, but in your own life, you know, you might choose to take a love triumph to improve your romantic relationship or your marriage. You might choose to take a drug to give you more self-control. You might choose to do something that makes, you know, you more likely to attract your own prudence. Or you might choose to take something that makes you a more moral person. I mean, I, I think those are choices that people certainly want to have. Um, and then you can choose them according to your set of values and realities. We have another paper on moral artificial intelligence. You know, you could, you could set up a moral AI app which you program in your set of values or outlooks. So you say, I'm a vegan, you know, and tell me about which, which restaurants in the area satisfy these, these, and these criteria about fair trade, veganism, you know, etc., etc. And it will, it will enhance your ability. That's a simple moral enhancement. It's determined primarily by, only by your own morality. So it could be very relativistic in that way. Um, or, it might, or it might not be. So I agree with you that's an important debate to be had. We have time for one more question. There is. Well, we have time again. All right. <laughs> then you need to see whether you can 
Now, see, in many cases, you'll disturb a complex system or you'll, you'll, you'll make a mess. So the plain God objection is right insofar as we often proceed into complex systems without sufficient understanding of, of the intricacies and dependencies and so on, and we make it worse. Absolutely agree with that. Fair enough. But in principle, if we have enough knowledge, can we improve on, 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 on nature? Sure we can. <laughs> you know, life is nasty, brutish, and sure, and, and limited. And there's no reason why the human lifespan couldn't be doubled. Um, with, with technologies that are on the, on the sort of horizon and understanding of biology, we've done it in, in mice, there's no reason why you couldn't do it in humans. Um, now, is it a good thing that humans have a natural limit of 120? No. I mean, we should choose how long we live and when we die and the circumstances under which we die. I mean, that's what it is to be a rational animal. So, um, yeah, in principle, I think presidents, judges, doctors, doc another study, doc surgeon, there's no, sur there's no, they're all, white coats have all gone. Um, I should have told them this. Studies of surgeons on modafinil, you know, to deal with sleeplessness, does it improve performance? It doesn't improve um, actual performance, fine motor performance, but it does improve decision making. So should, should doctors be on modafinil or neuro enhancers? Well, it depends on the cost benefit ratio to them and to patients. So if it's the case that they have long-term adverse consequences, maybe no. But, you know, caffeine is such an enhancer that's widely promoted. In fact, some hospitals say you have to drink six cups of coffee as a way of enhancing yourself uh, against tiredness. Now, we can surely do better than caffeine. And alcohol is another one. I mean, I, you know, here's a drug that's neurotoxic, hepatotoxic, and it's the widest used social enhancer. Here's them again. It's completely crazy. Well, surely we can do better than alcohol. <laughs> 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 <laughs>